Uh, first of all, welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining and Nazim, thank you for agreeing to take uh, to have this session with us. So Nazim is planning to talk about scientific methods of uh, prediction and to, to focus on the cases where we should use or maybe not use the biases that we have in geoscience. And of course, he's planning to have uh, to make it interactive, to have some questions that you can briefly type in the chat box or, uh, and one more exercise that might require you to take a screenshot, edit it, save it, and then attach it. Uh, he'll give you like five minutes to do so. So if you have any problems, you, you may not have the tool or don't know how, please type in the chat box uh, and let us know. Uh, and in worst case, maybe we can find other ways of doing so. And with that said, I'll hand over to Nazim. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to give me uh, that, the, for you to give me that opportunity at DSP. Um, I uh, made a similar uh, lecture here recently now, you know, in, for the SCG student chapter. Uh, so uh, my name is Nazim Abdullah. I work at BP. I'm an exploration geoscientist, but also um, you know, a prospect analysis advisor. Um, and I've got more than uh, 20 years uh, to experience in uh, uh, exploration and production. So um, that's my, but today I'm gonna be talking about um, many things and I'll try to fit it in about one hour. It's basically about how, how we think and how we work. And uh, in geosciences, it's um, a lot about scientific method and how we predict uh, success, but also misuses of how we predict and, you know, things that uh, we do bias ourselves against. And um, a lot of this is actually not so much a, a geology, but a little bit of everything. So sociology and psychology and, um, uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, basically a, a bit of a cognitive uh, geoscience, I call it. Yeah. It's not actually a, a a uh, technical talk, but it is because that you know that's the most important thing that we do. So I'll talk about uh, a little bit about uh, you know how complex our world is and you know what we're finding ourselves in right now. Then I'll talk about uh, some critical thinking and 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 uh, how we should be doing things together, and then about the insights and intuition yeah? and how that comes uh, to f uh, fruition when we you know successfully uh, achieve. Uh, insight and then i'll talk about uh you know how uh cognitive biases affect our uh, predictions and you know how important to know about them yeah and how to use it both in everyday life and your profession yeah so let me give this a little bit to the right so first is the uh a challenge so there is a challenge here and the challenge is that there's way too much data right now so if you start with it you know, a uh, printing press uh, back in 15th century. I think people were writing manuscripts before that. You know, that was the first explosion of the um, revolution, um, <laughs> techni technical revolution, people starting to read and the number of uh, publications multiplied. But that's nothing compared to when we went online. And right now, the content of the online um, increases exponentially. So I think if in 2006, you had way than less than I think it's probably terabytes of data, you know, and data volume was way below this uh, zettabyte. So right now, uh, we're at about 40 zettabytes of, or tr 43 trillion gigabytes of data in, in, in this year. So that's the increase of 300 times. Uh, scale of data is enormous. Six billion people have mobile phones, yeah? And uh, they have, is each company, you know, have terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of data stored. And uh, it, like, it shows how much more bytes uh, created each day. A lot of the information, you know, and uh, while it increased your access to information and then you can find things quicker, uh, it also um, complicates life because a lot of that information is A, useless and B, um, downright wrong and finding and, and uh, filtering uh, uh, with from the chaff is very difficult. And I think that's our, the job of um, 
our job is not so much now finding information but filtering what's important and trying to understand trying to uh, employ um, <coughs> critical thinking uh, in in doing so yeah so so that's sort of where it, it the, the the world is in addition to that the world is also quite unpredictable as you know from the COVID today and uh you know things that are happening to us all the time so-called VUCA world you know vol volatile uncertain complex and ambiguous decision are being um uh, <clears throat> you know you can't really uh follow the plan in any sort of organization without changing it very quickly and uh, um the volatility of the current situation is is uh out there, it's not something that people are really used to, and because we need narratives to navigate and have a, some antidote to chaos in in those narratives, that's why we create them. But we also have to be flexible to in order to uh, change according to conditions. So, you know, it wasn't uh, as it was always like that, but because of so much information and uh, there's, there's there is a you know the uh, ability to um, uh, influence events. Uh, even by in governments or companies are actually very low. So this is the world, you know, there's a lot of data and it's very uncertain and uh, ambiguous and, you know, really, uh, really we kind of underestimate the roles of uh, uh, luck in all of this. So that's two, you know, not say bad things, but you know, these bad, it's, it's the, these are the things, that's what it is, it's not bad or good. And then in addition to that, if we were robots, that probably been okay, because we would be able to, uh, to do exactly that and uh, find out, the, you know, the path of um, least resistance or find the path uh, that takes us to most efficiency, even in an unpredictable world. However, we are not robots and we are what is basically mentally lazy because we do uh, have a biological um, makeup and we think in two processes. You know, there is a book by um, Daniel Kahneman. I think it's a great book. Uh, he got the Nobel Prize in economics for, for it. And it's really describing the effect of two uh, mental systems that we operate on our decision making. So the first one is system one, which is the engine. It's basically engine to jumping conclusion. It's a survival mechanism. It's something that uh, happens when you, you know, when our ancestors saw uh, a lion jumping uh, uh, on them nearby. They didn't really think twice, and they made well. It, they they even sort of see a hint of it. They make a conclusion and they run away. Yeah, they don't have time for a, a desperate analysis. You know, that's not a something that they should be doing and otherwise it would have been wiped out long time ago and that system one is uh, really you know critical for making a quick decision but it is really um, it could be quite highly it would be quite biased and it could make wrong conclusions from the uh, evidence the system two though is uh, you know requires logical thinking but it's more earth effortful it actually requires a lot of energy so the energy required is uh, you know makes us you know tired so to speak and it takes so effort and then it's not really very decisive decisive because you need to make decisions quickly then this is not really a system to do it uh, but it is a system that underpins our science. So all humans do like system one because it's our default choice. But unfortunately, we have to make uh, uh, we have to make conscious decisions to think with system two. Yeah. So, so in all of that, our job is um, making. Uh, my job is making predictions, and you know, job of uh, scientist and engineer to also look at the. Uh, you know, the evidence in front of them and make some conclusions which lead to a prediction of what will happen, you know, uh, in this circumstances on that circumstances. And it is actually uh, both objective and subjective because we're not dealing with math here. It's uh, we are dealing with reality with the objective when you're talking about measurable hard facts that unbiased and balanced intersect with something which is has prior uh, in your personal uh, beliefs in it, assumptions, interpretations, and beliefs. You know, you can't be 100% um, ob objective because the facts that are in front of you are not 100% facts, actually. And that's, there are lots of uh, opinions. And, uh, so, you know, in my case, a geology is observational science, and that requires an application of subjective judgment. 
and it requires scientific method. So for instance, picture on the right here, yeah? So, you know, do I uh, say that represents a structure, right? So there's a structure here, um, there's a fault, and then basically you can't see under that. So that could imagine that could be a seismic imaging issue, or maybe there's a salt, you don't know, but there's a question mark. So therefore the, the predictions would say, well, I have some models, geological models that make me um, somewhat uh, uh, more um, inclined to say that the structure continues underneath that white area than does not. And I created those models, yeah, but these are just models. And, uh, you know, so there's a mix between the models and, uh, and uh, observation. If you had perfect data under the white area, then of course you would know that there is a structure because you mapped it, but you don't. And most of the cases in, uh, in life and in, in geology, you don't have these kinds of hard facts. So, so this is kind of an example here. And sometimes we also look at things in, in not look at things at scale, but only in a smaller pieces. And therefore we don't actually see uh, everything. Yeah? So we can't escape that. We can't escape not seeing it and we can't escape just having pieces and making an inference on the pieces. But the good predictors will acknowledge them and we need to take steps to understand and incorporate them. So crit use critical thinking. Uh, you have to learn from your experience. And sometimes when you accumulate the experience, you also have to think uh, outside the box. Because you know, if your models are, uh, if you can't think outside the box, you can't explain this. Because you will have to be all forever um, kind of tied to um, either say, well, you know, uh, I don't really know what the interpretation here is, or I will say, no, I think I have a model. And you know, therefore you'd have to be a little bit creative. So here is my first exercise. And for that, you know, uh, people who don't know nine dot problems don't need to reply. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you very quickly, uh, I'll give you, a, let's say what you need to do is if you have a snipping tool, you can capture that and draw on a snipping tool things. There are nine dots here arranged in a square, right? And what you have to do is you'll have to connect all the dots. All the dots have to be within lines by four straight lines. Don't have to lift the pen or just don't, you know, in your case, you will just follow with a curve. Uh, and you don't have, you shouldn't retrace any lines back, okay? So I will ask you to do that and just, you know, that will help probably to, um, um, you know, set up a scene, yeah? If it's very difficult to do, don't do it and just describe it here. Maybe that will be fine. Maybe if, you know, I think I'll probably just wait for a few answers. Say if I get five people uh, sending back through the chat window, that will probably be enough, yeah? Is that okay? And if people don't understand it, please, I can repeat. So yeah, so to build on uh, what Nazim said, yeah, you can just um, take a screenshot of it, and if you have a pen or with your mouse, edit it on uh, Paint or whatever uh, program you have, and then save it. And in the chat box, you'll see file, which allows you to attach it as a file, uh, and then it will like appear in the chat box, and we can discuss it. Yeah. Okay, so I'll give you, say, uh, let's wait for three minutes, yeah? So it's 16, 17 now in our time, and I'll come back to you uh, in three minutes, okay?
I guess one uh, obvious tip would be thinking outside the box or thinking outside of dots. Hello. So I see that people are drawing right on the screen. Yeah. Yes, uh, they are really advanced. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't yeah, need very... any thinking. <laughs> so uh, I think they don't need anything that's even better. Excellent stuff. Yeah. So let me ask. Uh, okay. So who's just drawn that blue curve? Can uh, can they say who did it? This one, yeah. Me. This. Me. Okay. Good. Good. Uh, what's your name? Maripel. Maripel. Nice. Uh, very good, Maripel. Uh, this is uh, out of the box thinking. Good. So I'll show you what you had to uh, do. Is basically if you unclick that. Oop, now we have to get rid of this uh, thing here. So I think I might. <sighs> now the question is how to get rid of that. <laughs> Do we know how to get rid of this? Maybe the, the guy share. who yeah who did it. Can you just, there should be a way of erasing it. Yeah, if we can raise our curves. One Maybe I'll one. stop sharing yeah. and, and then it'll work again if I, I'll click. So first I will share again mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. So, and then I'll uh, see maybe there was more in mm. the chat that I didn't For see. Another example of how to solve things. So you see what you have to do is that, uh, yeah, you, I think people actually did it on the screen, which is uh, even more advanced than I thought. But so the, the thing is that the uh, Maripel had a good, a, good alternative scenario because instead of actually getting the lines here you know trying to you can only connect it with five lines and in order to do it with four lines you have to do this and then you have to get outside the uh, dots because nobody said that you have to do it inside the dots yeah there was no uh, exercise but because in uh, kindergarten you assume that uh, you know that people are also have to uh, you know, uh, color within the dots. People do it most of the time, and so thanks for Maripel. He's uh, or she is, a, a, you know, done. You know, a creative job here, thinking outside the box. Yeah. So what is basically that's a good example of what is thinking outside the box. So what you have is that uh, say you get one mental model one, and uh, when you shift from that model into another one, uh, you would and you know basically an understanding of the story changes. This is a little lamp saying I've got it, yeah. And uh, you have it in three cer certain ways that you'll have to get a trigger. Sometimes you see uh, contradictions in the evidence that have been presented to you. You could say, hmm, something wrong. Uh, it is this pack doesn't match with that one. Let me investigate. And so then you use kind of a poor contradiction then to uh, build another story. And so you have an outcome. Uh, then you have something that is, uh, say, connection. You get coincidences or similar facts uh, popping up everywhere. And you say, well, maybe uh, this is similar to that. And let me uh, build some sort of a, 
um, you know, kind of implication. So you will add something in, you know. And then the third pass, which uh, this is from the book by Gary Klein, seeing that others don't, you'll also add the uh, creative desperation when you basically uh, have to make a decision very quickly. It's almost your system one thinking, and then you basically very quickly discard one assumption you know, versus the other. He worked with a fire um, uh, brigades or some some people example of where you know, like uh, in a fire, um, you had to, uh, the only way to escape was fight fire with another one. And uh, I think these decisions are made so quickly that uh, you, you know, you don't really have to think to analyze. So, so that's basically uh, your aha moments, yeah? And then they get, you know, this is what you gain inside. So what you have to do here in this, this is from the same book, yeah. So you have to escape the uh, existing belief, you know. So sometimes you have some wrong belief. So for instance, you have, you know, say closer to home, you'll say that uh, you believe that all of the uh, um, structural um, traps are going to work in this basin, you know, and this basin is going to work because of the, you know, working petroleum system, etc. But that's a flawed belief because, you know, you have all these anchors and uh, then you, you just have to remove it. And if you still stay with that, you'll be very fixed mindset. So that's basically your mindset here. And uh, you will be fixed uh, by that. You also be fixed by goals that you made for yourself. So if you said you had, you know, this, this is your plan and these are your goals, you know, despite of the new facts, you are not gonna be willing to change your goal. And then you will continue pursuing that even though the new facts come, yeah, and then you don't change. So that's not gonna help with the insight. The other thing is experience is a Im most important for insight. So if you don't have any experience in, a, in the area, it's unlikely that you have an insight there, right? You can say in in your everyday work that's okay, but in your you know when you work somewhere as an engineer, you have to have sufficient number of uh, for exposure hours to some of these problems. You should have seen these problems enough time to get an insight. Uh, it doesn't mean that you can do it, you know, when you're, you know, younger or working on an organization, but, you know, some sort of exposure uh, is very important. And, um, you know, especially exposure from the new light, say somebody comes from the university, he has a different set, set of eyes, and he will really help um the people who are working on the same problem but he would have already seen some of this in the university so that's why education is important education comes as an comes as an experience so don't worry you know, you can have insight the first day that you are you know working in a company if you're you know position yourself right and then the other thing is quite important important for shifting perspective is mindset shifts you know you there's you know active or passive you can just okay say well you know I'm just sitting there and the facts come flying in or uh, you'd have, you know, an active stance, always looking for solutions. Yeah. This is basically a mindset. Yeah. It's a mindset change. And uh, the other things that help are shifting perspective and the active stance when you do things like uh, turning the tables on you are doing pre-mortems, basically it's like risk reviews or reviews before you've actually done an activity about saying, well, what can be wrong here? And um, then, you know, cold eyes, it's something when people come in that don't know anything about the problem, you know, things like brainstorming, but there's a lot of ways of doing brainstorming. And then the other things that when you're thinking too concrete is very important for uh, planning and you have to do that because the organizations must have controls. Don't get me wrong, they must have exact plans and so on, but creativity sometimes could be stifled and uh, what you'll have to do is to know the organization, allow some space for an insight, allow some space for playful reasoning and speculative series. But don't do it too long because, you know, if you see, you know, in any meeting, especially in a companies, people don't like people speculating on something too much because things get need to get done. Yeah. So, so here is the, uh, this is a little bit about the insight on the critical thinking. Uh, the, it, it's, it's, um, basically um, having good reasons for our beliefs. So you have to form your beliefs only when you have good reasons to do so uh, in, in um, you know, in your, especially in your kind of uh, work and engineering problems and so on. 
And what you have to do is to create arguments to discuss reasons and belief. You have to be able to argue for your uh, point of view reasonably well. And the argument is a set of statements that create something that will uh, 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 comprise a reason for a premise of the, you know, of your proposal. Yeah? So you'll come up with an argument. And good argument has premises that makes conclusions um, likely to be true. And I will say that, you know, it make conclusion it's likely to be true. And there are two types of arguments. There is a deductive argument is when the truth premise guarantees the truth of a conclusion. Um, and then there is an ampliative arguments when it says that conclusion uh, probable, but it doesn't guarantee it. So for example, statement on the right, yeah, uh, there are three statements. I want, so I want to have a discovery. There are a third, second statement is, well, nearby structures have oil. And the third statement says, well drilled on the structure is an oil discovery. So which of these three statements, which of these three statements is uh, uh, a good argument and which is bad argument? Can you answer? Any thoughts? People want to do it in the chat or uh, ask, you can ask me directly. Yes. And I think there's a typo on the screen for P2, P2, but they, you can write it as P3. To, to That's correct. Clear. Yeah, that is correct. Yeah, I can write it as P3. Yeah. Uh -huh. Just drop All right. in the chat box. What do you think? Yeah, I can say, yeah, people can ask me in a, in a drop in the chat box. Yeah. This chat box seems to have a little delay here, yeah? Yes. Yeah, I don't know. It doesn't doesn't come up here. So to repeat the context, yes. Excuse me. Sure. Yes. Anyone wants to come unmute and like give a live answer? So which one is a bad argument, Nazim? Did I get it right? Which is a yeah? Which is a good out of the three? Which is a good argument and which is bad argument? And we are doing exploration and deciding if yes, you an exploration, you decide mm -hmm. which is a good argument and which is a bad argument. And the premise of this: Does the structure contain oil field? Mm -hmm. Guys, give it a try. There's just for each answer, you have like more than 30% of getting it right. Maybe there is a delay or something. Eh? Yeah. So maybe you can help guys exclude just one, one of the answers or just give them a little bit of a tip and guide. I think P3 says a good argument. P2 may be a bad argument. Um, Okay. Uh, Our chat box became alive. So yeah, yeah, have, I see that. Yeah. From Peter uh, says, uh, Vince Peter said the P3 is a good argument. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Maripel says P2 is a bad argument. And I think, yeah, it is. I think it just takes a long time. Uh, that's why the people answered. So I think I'll give you an answer here. So the bad argument is the P1. Yeah, because it's not really about argument. It's somebody just wanting to have a discovery, right? Um, and then there is a more. There are some people uh, split between P two and P three. Both answers are correct. So uh, the P two is uh, uh, not a bad argument because the nearby structures have oil. You know, maybe that one. And P three is 
definitely a good argument, yeah, because it's got a structure uh, with oil, yeah, perfect. So I think the uh, this one, now I'd, let's just save some time and maybe I won't cover the other question I wanted to ask, which one of them is a deductive argument, yeah? Out of the P2 and P3, which is a deductive argument? Let me try it. Uh, uh, Okay, I think people answered here. Uh, P3 answered uh, Gladys Joyce, and then Ulvia answered P2. So, it, and uh, I think there is more co for P3. There's split between P2 and P3. All right. Let's see. So, um, I think I'll give you uh, okay P3. So, I think more people here is uh, voting for P3. Uh, so that's correct. So I'll explain why. Because it says the deductive argument when truth guarantees the truth of the conclusion, which is uh, P3 almost guarantees, right? So there's no way. The structure question, is there an oil field? Yes, there is an oil discovery. Done. Yeah. Now the P2 is actually probable. Yeah, It means that you might have or might not have that. I mean, you have nearby. Well, so this is your prior, and we'll talk about the priors later on. Yeah. So I think this is uh, kind of good uh, info for the scientific method. So this is how we approach things when we think critically. Yeah? So the scientific method is an empirical method of acquiring knowledge because we do and we, we have observation. So the observation about nearby oil fields is a good observation. We're applying skepticism about what observed. And, uh, you know, obviously there are some, you know, distortions, but I think we just have to assume that for now. And uh, then it will involve formulating hypothesis via induction uh, and then uh, measurement based testing on deductions. And then these are the principles of scientific method. So simply here is the picture here of the steps of scientific method. Somebody first, you'll have to purpose ask a question. You have to know which uh, things you want to do. This you know, lady asks which type of fertilizers work the best. Okay, fine. And then you'll have to come, com, you know, do some background research. You have to read about the topic. Otherwise, you can't do any uh, research, right? You have to research and do any uh, testing. Then what you do is that eventually a proposed hypothesis, you say, well, I think my model number one is that you have, um, you know, that particular fertilizer working. And then you do experiment uh, in the observation. So, you know, uh, you think that the fertilizer A works best, and then you start growing the, uh, the different trees, and then there's results for A, B, C, and then mm -hmm. hmm, it looks like conclusion is right, and our hypothesis have been proven correct. So then you design and perform an experiment, and then you uh, do an analysis. In that case, it's this picture, and then you reach a conclusion. So there are two types of uh, so there are two types of uh, things that you got to do. It's a circular reasoning, right? So you'll come up from the um, theory to the uh, um, from the theory to confirmation, and uh, that is um, a, a deduction. And then you also work from the observations and come up with a theory. So when Sherlock Holmes made his deduction, that actually he was engaged in inductive reasoning, so it was wrong. Uh, just so that you take one thing to take away from the class that Sherlock Holmes should have been uh, talking about induction, not deduction, yeah? Deduction is when you start from the theory and go to the confirmation of that through observations, yeah? So uh, when you do in, in, in induction, you basically start from observing facts. Um, and then really what you do is that if you kind of, where does it fit in your uh, line of thinking? Imagine that you'd formulate ideas. And in that case, you know, for I'm just using my example of oil exploration, but you can apply it to any other area in, you know, in engineering or the tool, you know, study or, you know, petrophysics or whatever. So is there a working play or a prospect in this area? Is there a working then you say, okay, that's a reasonable question. There are going to be a hypothesis and hypothesis says say there is one. Yeah. And then what you do is that you then uh, start an experiment observation, which means in our case, mapping uh, trap, charge, reservoir, source, seal, and you know, mapping them just say, here do they exist? You know, this is basically your you know, your observation, you get the data and you observe on the data. 
And then what you have is that then therefore that gives you some geological models. And there is a lot of uh, possible geological models that could be created because the interpretation of data is not uh, singular, yeah? So you'll have some sort of a uh, definitely disqualified models. The disqualified means that these models you propose, but they don't fit the data. You have to take them out of the equation. And then you uh, apply inductive reasoning and you'll say, well, how many of them still fit the data? And you have some preferred model and you have some alternative model which could also explain the situation. And then you will come up with this, um, you know, model, you know, validation and we'll take, you know, few alternative models and the main model. And that will give you a resource input. Say you will calculate the volumes for the structure that you are finding out for exploration. Um, or you do it for the alternative one, and then the others will be failure models. So there is a, obviously uh, that has an implication for business drivers and, you know, and all of that sort of stuff goes into the further out in uh, uh, business. By the time you get to the business decision, some of these things get lost. So your ability is uh, uh, as a scientist to be able to take all of this into account and describe very, uh, um, in, in a good way, you know, what was your uh, logical thinking that brought you to the point and the description of the resources in, in the structure, for instance, yeah. So here is the, uh, this is very important to know. So what is the research itself? And uh, we do a little bit of research because we're finding new structure. Research is really uh, something that is a little bit more formalized. I mean, it basically is a systematic learning intent process. Yeah, you carry that analysis. And in my line of work, I carry that kind of analysis because I create a product from the, you know, um, interpreting seismic data. So you result in some sort of formal recording. So that means, pro, you know, report of resulting conclusions, right? So that's what we do. Now, the purpose of the research is new knowledge. It's something that you have found out. This has to be reliable and tested. Somebody else can go on and also map that kind of data and also say that this scientific work is reasonable. Yeah, it's uh, methods that you apply that are reasonable and it adds to new knowledge. So research and uh, this scientific method is not about gathering information. So somebody said, well, I gathered all this observation. Here we go. So, and then some people might do that, but that's not the research. It's also not the research, uh, it's not when you take one fact from one place to another and say, well, you know, it, it, I observe it here, uh, it must be over there. No, you have to marry that together. It's not just finding new information and republishing it in a different place, yeah? So it's really about, you know, using that kind of a scientific method to come up with a new knowledge. So this is what I was talking to you about the knowledge, right? So here is more news, bad news for you, man. So what is needed to excel in your work? Yeah. And I'm pretty sure that you are mostly either students or engineers uh, uh, that are working. Now maybe there are some of you have more experience than others. I don't know, there's 26 people in the chat, so I don't know your experience, but I have given you some information. So what you have knowledge base is, uh, concludes three things. You know, you have to know core professional skills. This is what you learn in the university. Then the professional skills in other areas. And also, if you work in business, you have to have some knowledge of the company you're working in, yeah? So, but you know, the bad news is only one third part of the pie, yeah? So if, you, if you're there, I mean, it's like number one, that's what you get hired for. But that's not at all everything that need, you, you need to be. So in order to be a well-rounded specialist, you'll have to do two other things, three other things. Let's go and describe what you have to do. So one of the other thing that you'll have to do is to be able to integrate work and communicate with others. So you'll have to work with other external stakeholders. You work with internal people at the company and uh, uh, that means that you have to understand their business. And then if you're an integrator of somebody's uh, other people's work, say if you're drilling wells, and you are in a well planning team, yeah? Or if you are uh, integrating, you know, work with uh, uh, putting some uh, tools on a new well and, you know, you talk to contractors and you talk to uh, drillers and, you know, and so on, you know, that means that you'll have to integrate all of their work to achieve results. So the people who do it best then get, you know, further ahead, yeah? It's quite important to know. So unfortunately, that's good. It's not just that, the green there's also this blue the other thing is that now you'll have to be 
flexible and adapt to change. So you'll have to think more critical and outside the box, think uh, both critically, but also outside the box creatively. And uh, that also means that you'll have to be a proactive uh, mindset and you can't just be relying on what you know, you've been told. And then, you know, the other thing is so this uh, digital skills. I'm sure I'm, I, I don't have that one, but um, some of you uh, might have much more of that. I mean, it was demonstrated by the exercise clearly, you know, but, you know, uh, things like Python scripting or, uh, you know, things that, that are more, much, much more flexible now that we were in the past. And I think uh, the new generation will obviously take that, but that's part of the adaptation to change. And then the, finally, uh, you do have to have, when you work, you'll, have to have some you know there are what people call soft skills behaviors and you know you also uh have to have some value and purpose and why you're doing what you're doing and what actually driving you and to be honest with yourself and then most importantly you have to be uh, physically mentally healthy so uh you will be surprised why i'm telling you this but you know if i were just told you that the only thing you have to worry about in geoscience is this green I'll be wrong, and uh, I think that's just not what you'd expect when you uh, through your career. Yeah. Okay. So this is the uh, this is kind of the um, um, summary of um, of where the uh, uh, thinking takes you and what you have to do. Um, but now we'll talk about barriers on your way, or let's not call them barriers. It's just something that you'll have to be aware of, and. Um, you know, when people talk about critical thinking and uh, hard facts, they don't realize that actually in their hard facts, they do exist. Like sun rises in the morning, it's an observation, yeah? Uh, and and, and uh, goes down in the evening, when it's even that is not true on the polls, yeah? But literally, there are hundreds of uh, psychologically tested biases. They are not some things that are wrong. They're just filters you see reality with, and they're very, very... Uh, reasonable in some place and some time, but not re reasonable in ours. You know, if you can't press raw reality, you can imagine that it's like, you know, seeing computer scripts uh, instead of information, you just see zeros and ones, right? So that's not really useful. So what you see is the processed bit of information in the brain. And you'll have to be aware of how you think, uh, be logical and uh, apply a scientific rigor where you can. Uh, but you just have to understand it. You know, there are so many biases. I wouldn't really go through all of them here. Uh, and there's a lot of play. I mean, the, again, the book I quoted is the best one to uh, ad address it. But there's a lot of stuff on the internet, and they're really funny things as well. So there, there's I kind of group them in three ways. So there are ways and biases in presenting things, communicating, and how much expertise you have. Then there are biases in you know how people apply logic and then there are kind of personal biases of you know self-deception yeah so let me go through uh, maybe a picture of the um, uh, biases of presentation uh, communication expertise yeah so this is about influencing uh, of other people it's very important for you especially if you are starting in a company you know the best the best one is of course the anchoring bias which is a tendency to fix things uh, on around the initial thought of estimate. It's like if everybody talks and the person who first expresses the opinion uh, will bias others, you will anchor and prime them. Then, you know, if there is somebody senior in the room who is older or has a management cap on, he will influence uh, uh, others because he's a manager, yeah? Uh, then, you know, there's also a tendency to uh, make decisions based on well-told story rather than in an expert opinion. So if the story is well-described presentation, then people will believe it better than bad described presentation. So somebody who's right, but he can't talk very well, he won't actually get their story across. There's thing that this hollow effect is basically a tendency of overvalue the opinion of uh, popular people. And, you know, uh, there's various of other things. So there are some, ways to think about it and reduce the impact as much as you can. So look at the data and interpretation, not the face of the person. You know, accept that you're not an expert in everything. Uh, practice and listen and seek an alternative opinion. So for example, in the conversations or in the meetings, try to ask for a, you know, a junior person to speak first. So then go to the senior person and so on. Have this thing called Q storming. Don't arrive to solution very quickly, but just ask things. 
and uh, try to be a written feedback. So it's all nice, but you know, all of this is uh, probably okay in some situations, but not in fast-paced world of business. And you'll have to be um, kind of um, very quick. This one I made an exercise before, but I'm just gonna you know, skip that. And you know, basically, here is an anchoring and priming. See, I anchored you uh, by the color here, and I'm saying that this 70 pounds. Uh, is what fish costs, but actually there's also a cost of 30 and 25. So uh, it's basically uh, when you depend too heavily on initial piece of information and anchoring occurs where um, during decision making, uh, making the subsequent uh, decision on it. So there's just few examples of how I would say, for example, in geoscience, that will be, I first received information like a well on seismic would be favored by me over the next piece because I have first information, I mapped it on the first, right? So therefore I believe that one uh, better. And especially uh, true when the new data arrives, there's gonna be a conflict between you will have to change your opinion. And in discussion and meetings, the priming and nudges first provided numbers will always influence the outcome, yeah? So that's where the role of advisors and interpreters is the key, you know? So you'll be, you know, some people who are more senior might uh, judge you, might, might uh, prime you, yeah? So you have to QC all the new, how the new data fits, um, okay? So that's anchoring. So there is a little bit of a study done on uh, primary and anchoring bias in the color schemes. So for example, uh, there are examples of presentation variables tested, and uh, you could say that you know people you know using assertive dubious language, uh, you know assertive language could be okay with some people. Uh, you know management is really like that, but sometimes you know the experts get the opposite opinion. Then obviously color uh, versus the black and white lines presented would be. Uh, um, uh, viewed positively and then the seismic versus blank background. So, you know, you would prefer to put both interpret, not interpreted and non-interpreted seismic together and that will uh, help people uh, to get your point across. Yeah, and uh, I think that's sort of where, uh, it is actually a real uh, paper here, yeah? Framing bias paper. Presentation of an image can change the perception of observer, yeah? even to the extent that presentation can modify the information. So, you know, you have some facts there in the presentation, but the way you showed it, it's not the same. And the person therefore thought about the same different thing. So it's very important in that way. And in reducing impact, you'll have to formulate your opinions from first principles. And uh, seek, try to seek other people's opinion, you know. And I think this this is just a great example of you know, uh, basically people were tested against that and then they selected that, you know, I think uh, this one comes across. So don't show us black and white lines, yeah. So um, next one is kind of uh, influenced by the choice of words. So here is the big kind of um, frame, you frame something and then here's the big structure, but somebody could say, you know, uh, to you that, well, project is really important to the company. It's a world scale opportunities. It will be great, but you have to do a good job. And so these kinds of words will influence you uh, to the way, yeah? So I think you'll have to be uh, very clear, both in terms of the people who make, um, uh, um, who, are, uh, who are telling people what to do, if they want them to be unbiased and the people who are doing the work, that um, people will be, and they will still be even after this one influence that, but at least it's important that you know that when uh, somebody tells you these kinds of words, that means that they're framing a discussion. So you just have to be aware. There's also framing bias and problems of scale. So for instance, if I show you what this is, you will say, I don't know, I have no idea what that is, yeah? Then you see, well, there's a map. Oh, it looks like there's a map here, right? Oh, this is a structure. It's in Azerbaijan. There's a structure here. It's here is Azerbaijan here, yeah, and here is the globe, and there is the Earth, right? So very different uh, scale, yeah. So if you see things at small scale, you are not able to say what it is, and if you see it at big scale, then you have big picture. So you have to do both, know both big picture and the small context. Then we'll talk about the um, another bias called availability. And it's basically, it's about what you see is all there is in, for you, yeah? 
And uh, that means that uh, you'll have a certain tendency to make judgments about likelihood event based how easily this example comes to mind. So for example, if something you know you just did yesterday, you will be able to remember it. It's a mental shortcut. And uh, you know, you'd be an immediate example that comes to mind. And uh, then therefore the other information that it's harder to get, for instance, if you're working on um, a well right now and uh, or the seismic right now, it will be easier to, uh, to do that and make information from there. And it's harder to look for other data. So for example, there's a nearby well that exists, yeah? And uh, it has a different, you don't have it. I mean, you may not have it in the company, uh, or you may not seen it, but you are obviously saying, well, the data I have is better than the one I don't have, which is strange, but it's true. For example, if you have uh, good core data and you say, well, I've got this core data information and uh, I interpreted porosity in the nearby well by this, but there's also 10,000 other points. A, you don't have them, B, you kind of biased against getting them for price and whatever. And so you think, well, I'm gonna apply that, you know, that point. That's why, the, but it's not statistically relevant. You'll have to get all of the other data. And I think this is uh, where it hurts people a lot yeah, in that kind of stuff. So reducing the impact, you'll have to say, you know, always ask yourself uh, what you think. Uh, look at all the other data that you don't know about or you just chose to ignore. And also always seek the alternative opinion and ask what the data is telling you. Is there a base rate? And I'll talk about the base rate in a minute, Sam. So then uh, another one is uh, it's a narrative fallacy or insight biases. So narrative fallacy is basically limited ability to look at sequences without weaving explanations. So for instance, there is a picture here of a lady uh, kind of drawing the circles after the guy shot in through, you know, so obviously A, that's a hindsight bias, and then she made some interpretation of that. And uh, the results of overconfidence, because sometimes we don't really know uh, what this is, you know, and we just make an interpretation. We believe kind of, uh, in example, logically correct coherent pro uh, description of events when there is a clear logical link, and, you know, that's fine. Uh, but, uh, you know, you, you may not be a, a, a correct one. Maybe it's been created after you've drilled a well. So there's a post-mortem mishinsight. We can connect exploration that ties all factors together, but it's done after you've already uh, achieved it. And the hindsight biases are always uh, there. And it's like, well, why didn't we think about that in the past? Well, because we didn't really have those links and uh, you know it's not really certain how many uh, times we can do that. Yeah? Okay, so yeah, you get some ways to reduce that. You know, do proper post mortems. You know, after you've drilled or had some uh, success in, the, you know, in in, um, in success or failure doesn't matter. Or you know, after you con conclude an operation, and you know, this done a lot, you know a lot of say prospect. Uh, or sorry, or, or project management. After you completed the project, you have to do a review. Look at the data, not just the story. You know, try to uh, look. You know, try to poke holes in the logic of the story, and uh, ask always ask yourself questions and seek alternative opinions. Yeah. The other ones are um, type of biases in biases in logic and risking, and um, there are a few things here that is kind of quite important. I'll try to uh, get through them in, in uh, one by one. So something about the regressive bias, which is a tendency to overestimate. We don't want to go and uh, kind of overestimate low probabilities and underestimate high probability. We don't like something to be absolutely certain and we don't something uh, like something to fail because when it fails, that means that we're not gonna, you know, you're not gonna present something that fails, yeah? If to your manager or anybody, so the, the idea, oh, great idea, but it doesn't work. That nobody's gonna do that. And then nobody wants to do something like to say, well, hey, I've got like absolutely 100% in the circle, it's gonna work, yeah? So as a result, people try to put something in the middle, but actually in the world, we have everything from here to there. So clearly you're gonna be biased in that way. Uh, there's also base race neglect is a tendency to ever value you know, uh, something that you have versus statistically correct data. And then, you know, obviously the, you're influenced by emotions. There is a uh, sunk cost fallacy and a loss aversion. So again, the same sort of stuff here. Let me talk a little bit about base rate neglect, yeah. 
So base rate is uh, something that refers to a prior probability of an event. Base rate neglect uh, refers to the phenomenon where people ignore uh, the statistically relevant information. So I will give you a, a good example. You'll have to answer me now. And, and there's a little bit of math involved, but I think um, try to, um, I mean, as, as an example of this uh, bias equation, and that's really based on the Bayesian uh, uh, logic. Yeah? It's uh, um, pro Bayesian probability. So um, imagine that you have a, there is a, you know, not imagine, we have a disease here, right? So there's, you know, it's an infection, yeah? And you've been administered the test and you're not, it, the test is 99.9% .9 accurate and you've been tested positive, which is awful, right? So it's not great to be tested positive. So what is the probability that you are infected? Yeah. So I give you a, another piece of information. So 100 million people were tested and about 1,000 are infected at any given time. Yeah. So in that one, could you given this, uh, well, try to, to give the formula or just without the formula, try to give me um, uh, what do you think is the probability that you are infected? Is that clear? And then, you know, if, if, if not, you, you know, I can look for answers in the chat, but I can repeat the question if it's not clear, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wrote the question again in the chat box just in case. Yeah. Can you give me one more minute?
Okay, so I think Shahriyar is the only person who answered, yeah? So if there's no guesses, I'll say to you, um, all right, let me just check, making sure that there's none. I mean, let's go make sure. No. So um, he's right. You're right, Shahriyar. Uh, and uh, you'd be surprised. Yeah, it's like, it's a very accurate test. So why is that? Uh, you have very low chance of being infected. I mean, the thing here is that you clearly had this some uh, prior information to the test. If you only known that your test accuracy 99.9%, .9%, you could say, well, yeah, I'm, you know, 99.9, .9, I've got a test, but that's not correct. Because what you have to do is that you'll have to find, you know, you have to divide people in two groups. You know, there are people who are non-infected and you know given that you only have 1000 people infected at any one time that's a clear information yeah and that's a prior information that you receive here and uh, the uh, that means that you say well how many of them actually if i apply 99.9% .9 to the uh, uninfected group yeah so i end up with the uh, 99 million 9,800, you know, uh, of people being positive, but that still leaves about 10,000 people who were identified, misidentified as um, infected, but they're not infected, yeah? And so if then you basically say, well, there is a thousand infected, but 10,000 of wrongly identified by infected, then I'll, I'll, I'll end up with a, um, about 10% probability, yeah? So it's only so that information about 1,000 people infected and the fact that 100 million were tested uh, gives you uh, new prior information that you update your hypothesis and then the posterior information, the one that you received, that creates you a 10% chance of um, uh, of being infected. So that's why people, uh, the, the doctors, don't test people just at any way, you know. So like when they say, for example, the test is test is the um, uh, when they say that the test is 99.9% uh, um, .9 accurate, that is not correct because the, uh, well, it is correct for the test, but it's not correct for you. And that's why the doctors will look at the other um, ways to improve it. So for example, if you have some additional symptoms, say you have a temperature, that means that you have already increased the risk, right? So how many of the misidentified 10,000 uh, 10, people have temperature? Yeah, well, actually, if you find out that only 5% uh, you know, of them have temperature, then your risk of being infected increases. So I think Shahriyar was right. He answered 10% and, and I think that's sort of an example of the base rate and then gets neglected. Even when doctors presented with that kind of information, they sometimes make uh, these kinds of mistake. Yeah? And uh, for us in the uh, exploration, it's uh, quite you know, like uh, related to say, well, you know, I've drilled some wells. And if you don't know uh, what is the past uh, record of, uh, discovery or failure in the ex in certain uh, play you will come up with some view however if you know that 10 wells around the well that you're planning has failed then means that you they will not be you know you can't make a um you know a, that a high, you know high chance of success so at least it will be definitely below one in ten and that's what's called base rate and you know people in neglect basically uh statistics um Statisticians don't like it because it's actually introduced a personal opinion and belief factor, right? There is a belief here is that at any one time, 1,000 people get infected. Somebody has a different figure, 2,000 or 3,000. So the way to improve that, you know, on con con confine on a base rate is have more people uh, evaluate the data and eventually they may actually create a reasonable uh, base rate understanding. The other um, thing here is that we get, uh, is endowment effect is like I like a value uh, what I have better than what I don't have. So I value, for example, there's a picture of a mug. Yeah. So if pe if you have a mug, if you have uh, uh, you would sell it for more than you buy it. You know, the same ex exists in the real um, uh, estate sector, right? Because you own something. Uh, and that just mere uh, ownership makes you do that. And because you're not 
objective here. And the same thing work happens in the work that you value the work you do better than the other work. So I value prospect much higher, say, because I worked on it for many years and I prefer to keep it. And, you know, obviously somebody would just hate the idea of selling his house for less money that he bought it. And uh, sometimes it works like on the sunk cost stuff. It, you know, we have invested so much energy and money uh, working on the core data. Yeah. So let's continue until we get a result. Well, how, how long are we going to continue? One year, two years, three years, five, ten years? Well, maybe we have to stop. And that sort of, uh, uh, you know, endowment effect, that, that sort of loses you a lot of money also. Uh, because, you know, if you're strongly biased in retaining what you have and investing in what you've already invested, you know, you'll have to have a, some point, uh, you know, of, of, of stopping this activity when you think it's not profitable or in case of, say, science doesn't bring any value. Yeah? So this is sort of where it's quite uh, important to know. The other things, and uh, these are more personal uh, things, but they influence work hugely. Well, not all of them here. For example, uh, things like optimism bias is the uh, tendency to believe that we're less likely uh, you know, to, to experience negative effects. It's especially true for people who uh, make, you know, business, you know, decisions. That's why we have businesses in the first place, because, you know, if you knew that you open a bakery and it has only one, you know, uh, out of, you know, uh, 10,000 bakeries, uh, only 1,000 uh, works, it's a huge bias against you. So therefore you won't open any business, but that's not how it works. People are always more confident that they will succeed when others don't which is great because that's how people, you know, otherwise we would stop doing any work. Then there is a illusion of control, this tendency for people to overestimate their ability to control events. So for example, you would, uh, you know, you think that you, when you drive, you control things more than you actually do. And that's why people are afraid of flying because they think that they can't, they, they can't really control uh, a plane. Uh, you know, obviously there's, um, there's something related to the uh, attribution error is a tendency to explain someone's behavior based on them and their personality, but something happens to you, you're more likely to blame others for it, right? That's a very, very common thing to do. And, um, you know, it's like, you know, well, why? Why does it work for you? Hold on a second. Oh, that why would it work for you and uh, not for others? Why others can't blame? You know, that sort of happens. You know, you need to be aware of that. And um, you also have, uh, you know, usually an overestimation and optimism of planning time. So you failure to forecast. It always happens because you know you sort of, you know, plan for something short and then it takes usually longer. And uh, that's people always take on risky projects because they overestimate the odds. Um, you know, now you would say why? Well, some people don't overestimate the odds. There are people are about 50-50, right? There are people who are people who are more risk averse, and the people who are less risk averse. People who do things, uh, you know, because they're uh, confident, and the people who don't do things because they're less confident. Well, let me tell you that if the people are less confident, they actually don't do the work, right? They would prefer not to do it. So therefore, that 50% of the people out of the equation and then the rest of the 50% are very confident. And of course, those types of people will always uh, over uh, be overconfident and, and that's what happens. That's why most of the projects are uh, over budget and, you know, long, because the people who do this are like that. And the people who are not confident in their abilities will not do any projects. So that's how it works, unfortunately. There is a middle ground, but, you know, it's very hard to achieve in organizations. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, like this, oh, we didn't know how long, you know, it takes, there's a ten tensions and, and so on. Okay, you, you know, there's obviously a right, right uh, planning is to be agile and have right planning and milestones here. And you always have sort of pre-mortem for projects. Think about all the possible failures that could happen maybe and uh, visualize a right path forward. Inv invite a few skeptics in the room, you know, just to make sure that that so this is exactly what i was talking about so the people are they do have uh, their positive and negative self-deception but they are people who always think that they'll end up in failure right but you know studies and negativity related to the decision making basically show that you know in in uh, that means that in a situation when a person stands to gain or lose something 
you know, potential costs were, you know, obviously argued more than the potential gain. So here is like, you know, the brain looks, oh, hey, you know, there's a lot of good stuff here, but you always concentrate on the bad. So, in, you know, it works in even in the confident people. If you say, well, you're going to, you know, uh, you know, uh, there's a chance that you win a, a million, um, but in the long term, but in the short term, you would, uh, you know, lose um you know, um, hundred thousand or two hundred thousand, whatever. You know, yeah, it makes sense, but the short term hits you, and it's more immediate. And you might actually prefer uh, to be risk averse, and that's what most people um, do. And uh, and there is a little bit of a, you know, if you go to there's an optimism bias, but the pessimism bias is what you know is basically uh, means that we not do much. Yeah. So uh, unfortunately. Uh, that's why uh, the world is kind of built mostly on you know, optimists because they do stuff. And uh, yeah, whether it's, whether it's always right to do stuff or not is another matter. And uh, finally, I wanted to conclude the talk here with a few really good books and I'll advise you to read them. So the first set of books is all about the, um, you know, things like uh, um, you know, uh, Prediction and uh, The Black Swan by Nassim Nicholas Taleb is a great book or anti-fragile or, you know, things like, um, you know, how to, uh, uh, let's say, it's not about, you know, a failure of, you know, you sometimes very confidently think people predict it, things, but, you know, uh, we have, we're underestimating our all of luck in all of this. And, uh, you know, we, it's, it's really uh, difficult uh, because we need to build narrative stories. Then there's something on the mindset, and I think this is going to be really useful for you to read. Um, you know, what kind of, uh, you know, growth mindset to develop to uh, increase your potential. And there are obviously a great book for Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, from which majority of presentation is taken. And uh, there are some other books on Insight, but it's the one I currently recommend you reading. Um, you know, how people generate insight and, and, and innovation kind of springs from there. So I, I really uh, finished my talk here with a final word of caution. So first of all, you'll have to say that knowing all biases will not make you less susceptible. You will still continue doing what you're doing and you will still be making biases. You can't really uh, be, you know, we're not robots and we can't be logical. Even when we say we're logical, we're not. And, uh, you know, knowing is not half the battle even, you know, it's, it's, it's just knowing. I think the, uh, the battle is just basically being able to make sense of the world with everything that you already know. Yeah? And uh, I think I, might, I hope that my talk is helpful you in, in this regard. And I also welcome any uh, questions or from the audience or we have discussion on what we already seen just now. Yeah? I'm done. I don't know if uh, anybody will. Uh... All right. Uh, Nazim, so I think we have uh, yeah biases on individual level, but things get much more dangerous uh, when you we have them in a form of a group. So would you give us more information how it works in the oil and gas business and how uh, we make sure that we don't have that um, level of bias? So, yeah, I think what you, it's, very, it's a good point. So we'll have to go into, let's go back to this picture here. So for instance, the, uh, uh, what you have to do is that we have a set of, so if your, uh, your personal bias translates into the team bias and then it translates into the management and then management have, everybody has their own agenda right uh you have to put some internal checks and balances on that and the internal checks and balances two ways there is always a um some sort of an assurance team you know and you know in our organization for example in both exploration and the res reservoir development we have uh, centralized assurance teams with senior geologists that look at people's interpretation and uh, work with them also they work jointly with teams on the, the matrices so for example we have um short you know shortcuts uh, scorecards matrices for different prospects and opportunities and uh, the people who work 
not just say in Azerbaijan, but other places, there you can just put all these matrices together and look at, you know, how are we actually scoring things better or worse? What is it benchmarking against? The word benchmarking comes from the fact that you want to compare something against, you know, you have marked it, right? So if the reservoir in, uh, a, a, you know, ACG and that facility reservoir is producing at this rate, and then you go somewhere else and uh, your rate is really high because you want to help your prospect, they, that, that benchmarking won't allow you to do it, right? So this is another way of doing this. Then, you know, it's also important to look at, therefore it's important to look at all the data, yeah? And when you're presenting, it's important to look at the data, not the presentation. It doesn't really excuse you from presenting badly, right? I'm not saying you have to present a good story, but just not present it and not communicate. Hey, yeah, but then then it's going to be bad. But you'll, you know, the people always have on the other side make an effort to look at the data, not how you are confident in presenting. And then somebody has to ex accept that you are not expert, and you'll have to re uh, listen to other opinions. So the problem with, uh, you know, sometimes you will just do work and not listen to others, and because it's slowed down, you know, everybody will have ten thousand opinions, right? And if you need to do project clearly, you need, the, the best way maybe you get some single formalized review, we call them peer reviews of the people who, who know uh, from other areas and then some formalized uh, assurance reviews. And, uh, you know, in the team, so that's sort of how, how it helps, you know, to filter out. So hopefully by the time you get to, you know, management level, then they get more informed opinion, you know, and I don't know who's, you know, somebody needs to check everyone, it's not easy. So obviously, it's not in, it's in, impossible to eliminate all the bias. But you know, if you have those sorts of reviews and discussions and incorporate other people's opinions um, and listen to them, you know, even sometimes uh, the person who is quiet could give you a uh, help, right? And uh, you know, you get these kinds of sessions first. So don't rush into doing and presenting. Think uh, and and uh, work with others. So that's my advice, you know, in our line of work, it's the same thing. If you just rush and, you know, because somebody's pressuring you in presentation and you have done the work and you have not consulted and it could, it's wrong, the management takes it. And then they, you know, finally when there's a presentation, they will blame you that you've, you know, you know what I mean? They shouldn't blame, but that's what happens, yeah. Thank you, Nazim. It's it's great that the, everything has been considered and cross-checking and everything. And I love the part you said about presenting, like presentation is not, everything is not reflected on a slide pack. Yes. Yeah. Any, uh, yeah. any, any other questions maybe from somebody? I saw there was a question from Shahriar once. I don't. We, I think I saw it somewhere. He's asked uh, which of these uh, induction and deduction more lucky in terms of oil discovery. Well, I think what it is is that you'll have to work all of it together. It's not really one reasoning versus the other. It's not like you go and say, I've got a theory and a hypothesis and then I observe and confirm it. Well, you observe, but you can generate maybe other theories, right? Here you only had one. So what you have to do is that you have to go back here, which means that you have in inductive reasoning now and create a new theory from observation. And then you observe it more and you create again. So basically, if you look here, this is like a continuous circle of scientific method when you have to employ both induction and deduction reasoning. If you just imply, say, deduction, you know, and just observe, 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 uh, and stay at the bottom, then you won't be able to actually get, you know, your model. And here, if you have a model only, then you, you just can't, you know, uh, you need to collect some observations. So both of them work together. Is that okay? Thank you, Nazim. I think you gave us quite a lot of food for thought and to reflect back. And also, I think that the, the slide with um, recommendations of books it was also great. And what we have to do is, yeah, I'll, I really thank you for your time and accepting our invitation to share your knowledge. Yep. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, well, um, uh, let me know if you need more. I'll, I'll obviously expand on that as well. Yeah.